Hi, this is Daryl Meyer from Keller, Texas. Today is Tuesday, August 17th, 2010. Man, hearing a lot of chatter about this uh, August 21st deadline when Russia will give fuel to the Iranian nuclear power plant at Boucher. Um, let's, let's talk about this. This first story out of Yahoo.com says Israel has eight days to hit Iran nuclear site, according to um, Bolton. This story says Israel has eight days to launch a military strike against Iran's Boucher nuclear facility and stop Tehran from acquiring a functioning atomic plant, a former U.S. envoy to the U.N. has said. Iran is to bring online its first nuclear power reactor built with Russia's help on August 21st when a shipment of nuclear fuel will be loaded into the plant's core. At that point, John Bolton warned, it will be too late for Israel to launch a military strike against the facility because any attack would spread radiation and affect Iranian civ civilians. Once at uranium, once those fuel rods are very close to the reactor, certainly once they're in the reactor, attacking it means a release of radiation, no question about it, Bolton told Fox Business Network. So if Israel is going to do anything against Boucher, it has to move in the next eight days. Hold on to that thought, because he changes here in a minute. Uh, absent from an Israeli strike, Bolton said, Iran will achieve something that no other opponent of Israel, no other enemy of the United States in the Middle East, really has, and that is a functioning nuclear reactor. But when asked whether he expected Israel to actually launch strikes against Iran within the next eight days, Bolton was skeptical. I don't think so, he said. I'm afraid that they've lost this opportunity, he said. But who knows with Israel? Uh, remember the strike they had on Syria uh, a few years ago on their nuclear reactor just flew in bombed it flew out and whew, this this is kind of up in the ante here here's another story though out of the Jerusalem Post dot com uh, let me see here this says Obama won't hit Iranian reactor but Bolton claims Israel only has three days to strike the Boucher plant Former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. John Bolton said he didn't see any signs whatsoever that President Obama would make the necessary decision to strike Iran's nuclear reactor, speaking in an interview with Israel Radio today, Tuesday. Bolton claimed Israel only has three days to strike before Russia begins the fueling process for the Boucher reactor this Friday. They've moved it up a day, after which any attack would cause radioactive fallout that would reach as far as the waters of the Persian Gulf. In an interview with Fox Business Network earlier Tuesday, Bolton had said the deadline was eight days, but he revised it to three in the Israel radio interview, saying Iran and Russia had announced they would begin fueling on Friday. Oh, boy. <clears throat> he goes on to, to talk about uh, the Osiric uh, attack in 1991 and North Korean reactor built in Syria back in 07. And he said he didn't see any indication that an Israeli strike was going to happen, but he went on to say if Israel were going to do something, they wouldn't exactly be advertising it. <clears throat> so, this this is... It's, it's a little daunting to think that this could be right upon us. You know, a lot of people say, Daryl, why do you follow this stuff? Why, why are you watching these kind of things? What, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. If you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, you see that many nations will come against Israel. Um, if you go to Ezekiel 38 and start in about verse 4, it says, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaw, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Cush and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also Gomer with all its troops, and Beth to Togarma from the far north with all its troops, and the many nations with you. And it's clear what will happen to these people if you start reading around verse 18. It says, This is what will happen in that day. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused declares the Sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. 
The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment upon him with plague and bloodshed. You know, it goes on to say, And I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That's what it's going to take for a lot of these people to understand who the true God is. There's only one true God, but there's many false gods that many other religions pray to. And that makes God angry, makes him jealous. He's a jealous God. He said so himself. You know, in Joel 3, verse 2, it says, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. <sighs> you see any correlation with what the Bible's talking about, with what's going on today, as they're trying to divide up God's land right now? Right now, people. This is happening. You know, Zechariah 14.2 says, I will gather all nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. And then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. You know, in Psalm 83, verse 2, it says, See how your enemies are astir. And then it goes on to name many of these nations that are enemies of God. People, I just... We need so much more right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't already, people, time is running short. There comes a time when the threshold can no longer be reached. You know, when Jesus returns in all his glory, says the whole world, all the people of the earth will tremble. They will know at that moment that Jesus Christ is God in flesh, that he is the Son of God, and that he is here to judge. All right? If you haven't accepted Christ, as your Savior at that moment, guess what? It'll be too late for you. There comes a time when there's no longer any time. The time to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior is now, people. Time is drawing short. His coming is approaching. Ah, let me go on and read some other stories. This one out of the Depka file. Putin pushes ahead with fueling up Iran's reactor. Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin decided it was safe to go ahead and load Iran's first nuclear reactor with fuel on August 21st. Well, we've heard it's going to be the 20th now, effectively making it active after the Kremlin's weekend announcement of this intent seemed not to trouble the U.S. and Israel. Oh boy, this is coming, people. It's coming. You need to know Jesus Christ. He is the only way you can be saved. The only name under heaven by which you can be saved. Okay, here's a story out of Newsmax.com. Iran says an attack on the plant would be an international crime. An attack on Iranian nuclear facilities would be an international crime, Iranian nuclear chief Ali Akbar Salehi was quoted as saying today. In an interview with IRNA, Salehi said that the impact of such a strike would be global. This is stipulated in the resolutions passed by the IAEA and the UN Security Council, as well as in the resolution adopted at the close of the NPT Review Conference, he stressed. This cracks me up. Here they are, the very people they have snubbed, the IAEA. They've, they've snubbed them, they've not allowed them in to inspect their nuclear facilities, they've denied that they're trying to pursue weapons, and yet here they are, crying to these very people they've snubbed, saying, they can't do this. They're breaking the rules. Well, hello, Iran, you've been breaking the rules the entire time, not allowing inspectors to see what you're doing. So it's funny how they want to use these uh, these offices of administration when it suits them, when it benefits their agenda. Yet, it's the very same people they've ignored and, and told to go away when it didn't suit their agenda. Oh, boy. Crazy, crazy world we live in. Crazy world. Here's an interesting story out of Yahoo.com. Iran says to unveil array of new weapons next week. This out of Tehran. Defense Minister Ahmad Vahidi said today on Tuesday that Iran will unveil next week an array of new weapons, including missiles, 
speedboats, and a long-range drone, the ISNA news agency reported. So they're coming out with new missiles. Hmm. Just a couple of days after fueling their first nuclear reactor. Interesting. Wonder what else they'll come up with. Um, oh, God, please help us and protect us. Here's a story out of businessweek.com. says, Iran threatens Israel's existence if it attacks. Iran will respond if Israel attacks its first nuclear power plant, which will begin loading fuel August 20th, according to the Persian Gulf country's defense minister. In that case, we will lose a power plant, but Israel's existence will be in danger. Ahmad Vahidi was cited as saying today by the state-run Mir News Agency, in response to questions about the possibility of an attack by Israel on the Russian-built atomic facility at Boucher. Oh man, this is all over the news today, people. It's all over the news. Here's something you probably won't hear on any of your news channels. This is out of the Depka file, depka.com, D-E-B-K-A.com. Air crash near Boucher, drones slam into reactor dome. Two mysterious incidents are reported by Depka file in the run-up to the fueling of Iran's first nuclear reactor Saturday, August 21st. Tuesday, August 17th, an Iranian F-4 Phantom fighter jet was claimed by Tehran to have crashed six kilometers north of the Boucher nuclear reactor in southern Iran. Depka file's military sources report it was shot down by Russian-made Tor M-1 air missile defense batteries guarding the reactor. A local government official, Golem Riza Kestkar, said the pilot and co-pilot ejected from the plane before it crashed and were rushed to the hospital. The Tor M1 is designed to intercept planes or missiles coming in at medium or low altitudes in case of American or Israeli attack. Okay, uh, let's see. A previous incident on August 1st, uh, where it says... Oh, Tuesday afternoon after the fighter jet crashed, the Foreign Ministry spokesman Ramin... Maman Perarast warned any aggression against the nuclear plant can provoke serious reactions. Uh, let's see. On August 1st, three unidentified UAVs slammed into the reactor building, scaring the townspeople who were sure the plant was under American or Israeli attack. Okay, so we're, we're already seeing some things happening here, and um, I don't think Israel is going to allow this, this nuclear plant to come online. I need to get into the word. These things are just driving me nuts. Let's go to Psalm 18, verse 49. This was David. He said, Therefore I give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. Okay, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. That was a very strange thing for David to write here in Psalm chapter 18. Why? Because Gentiles, who were non-Jews, were typically regarded by the Israelites as being beyond the promises or even beyond the reach of God. In fact, the term Gentile had become synonymous with pagan or heathen. It wasn't just a word you would associate with the sacred name of God. So, when David declares that he would praise God among the Gentiles, it must have perked up a few ears and raised a few eyebrows. The Gentiles? Why is David dragging them into our special relationship and our sacred bond with God? Why is he mixing the two when they have nothing to do with us? You know, to be fair, it was understandable why the Israelites viewed their bond with God as something that primarily separated them from everyone else. I mean, they are the chosen people. Why are they the chosen people? Because God brought the Savior of mankind, Jesus Christ, to the world through the Jewish people. Okay? It had kept them relatively safe and secure from the evil influence of the nation surrounding them, but David reaches a point of praise where he declares that God's goodness is so great that it transcends these divisions. For David, nobody was off limits from hearing about the grace and glory of God, not even the Gentiles. So, is that our heart as well? Or do we have a list of those we consider to be off limits when it comes to sharing the goodness of our God? Are there people we instinctively write off as lost causes? There shouldn't be. The gospel is such good news that it deserves and needs to be shared with absolutely everyone, even the modern-day Gentiles in our lives. God, I pray you'll help us to be like David. Let us be impressed with your goodness so much that we can't help but share it with our atheist and Muslim friends all over the world. God bless you. I hope to see you.